Okay, uh, welcome back from spring break. I hope you all had a good break. Um, hope you did something that is not staring at a screen. Um, the weather was excellent. So um, it was also kind of a uh, uh, sort of hopefully a relaxing thing after the midterm, which maybe was not the easiest thing, right? Um, I right. I promised you it won't be easy. Uh, we are still in the process of grading it. Um, we will probably get, we hope to have something done by um, next week. Let's see. Uh, there's also this, uh, since we are starting, uh, we're continuing where things left off. We'll have homework four um, available on Canvas uh, on Thursday. And this one's going to be different from all the other homeworks in the sense that uh, it will involve absolutely no um, uh, programming. It will be entirely theory. It will focus on computational learning theory. And uh, those of you who like math will like this homework. Those of you who don't like math, well, it's homework four. Uh, uh, due to a scheduling complication, we will not have uh, office hours today. I won't be having office hours today. Uh, the other office hours of the week go on as uh, usual. Other announcements. Uh, um, I also see that this particular projector has really awful contrast. I'll try to make up for that. Um, the project milestone, the date has been changed. Um, uh, several of you emailed me saying uh, you'd like the project milestone to be moved by a few days. Uh, and I thought, you know, it makes sense. I don't want to throw a milestone at you right after spring break. So we'll, the milestone is going to move to next Tuesday. Um, by the, the goal for this milestone is you should have had at least one non-dummy submission on Kaggle. Um, and the easiest way to do that is to use the code from your homeworks uh, on the data from the from for Kaggle, uh, I mean the project data. And you have to write a short report. And by short, I mean really short. A paragraph will do. Um, I just need to know what you've done and what you plan to do. Um, or and when I ask you what your plan with, uh, with the for the project is, it's not like I need a like a detailed step by step plan. It, uh, you know, it could be rather uh, vague. It doesn't have to be detailed. I want you to start thinking about it though. And also include some descriptive statistics about the data. What I mean is, uh, you know, things like how many examples are there? What's the, um, uh, what, what happens if you pick one of the labels more than the other? Anything interesting that you might find from any of the features that uh, we have? Um, anything, so, you know, just explore the data. I would like you to explore the data and tell me what you see. Uh, use Piazza for discussions. And uh, some of you have already started submitting uh, uh, your your predictions on Kaggle. And as of maybe a few hours ago, the leaderboard had some, uh, the, the top of the leaderboard was a, a submission with 79% uh, accuracy. Um, I'm sure by the end of the semester, this number will go up. Um, there's a question, will the exam be curved? Uh, the exam won't be curved. The curving, the the uh, curve will be uh, applied at the end of the semester over the aggregate across all the things that you have. Just a reminder that the exam is worth only ten percent of your final uh, score that will be used for assigning your grade. Each exam is worth, I think, ten or fifteen percent. I forget the number. Do you remember any of my TAs? It's ten percent. Um, so uh, it doesn't uh, make sense to curve each thing separately. Rather, I would. Uh, I would like to uh, look at the aggregate and decide. And undergrads and grads will be treated differently in the aggregate. Any questions about the milestone, about any of these things? Yes. So by the end of the semester, we're supposed to um, submit the code of six different models, right? Good question. Uh, in fact, that's the I just wanted to remind you. So you should have six different non-dummy submissions um uh, and by that i mean you you need to have uh you know so but by non dummy i mean the, the one that the dummy submission was the one that you made at the beginning where you just uh, it, it was all positive or all neg negative non dummy is the output of some uh, learning output uh and the rules of the game if you remember from the uh, project document you need to we provided four different feature sets uh, you need to use across these six, at least two of them. You could do that in many different ways. You could, for instance, have uh, uh, the same algorithm 
uh, applied to two different feature sets. Um, or you could have, you can combine those features somehow. You could do, uh, you, there, you, you, this is uh, something that I want you to kind of uh, play with. Um, you could have feature transformations that do something interesting with all these features together. You could extract some information from one feature set and another, or three of them or whatever. Um, you need to use at least four different uh, algorithms that we cover in class. Um, we've already covered at least two. Um, we've done perceptron, we've seen uh, 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 decision trees. We'll be looking at uh, support vector machines. We'll be looking at logistic regression. We'll be looking at boosting, uh, which is an ensemble method, but we'll also be looking at other ensemble methods. And ensembling essentially is a mecha mechanism for uh, combining learning algorithms. So you could ensemble decision trees. You could also, an ensemble is just a committee. You could ensemble other types of models. Yes. What do you mean exhaustive stuff? In a lot of places, ask if you know how to use the machine learning libraries, so you don't necessarily care the different methods. Right. Scratch. Will we be doing any learning about how to use these libraries? Or is that something we should take more on? Um, first of all, nothing stops you from uh, exploring that on your own. Um, and we won't be looking at any specific library because uh, by looking at by focusing on the libraries, we'll be we'll end up committing to the design decisions of that library. Uh, that said, though, I would strongly, strongly encourage um, you exploring the following libraries on your own: uh, PyTorch and Scikit-Learn, um, because these are essentially industry standard things. If time permits, sometime towards the end of the semester, we'll see if we can have a a TA-led session introducing these libraries to you. And by the time this session comes up, uh, you would be familiar with most of the, the terminology that goes into these libraries. Because if I say right now, logistic loss or cross entropy, it might not make, you might not directly map it to something conceptual, but uh, hopefully by the end of the semester, we'll see if we can do that in class, or maybe we'll offer it as an optional. If you're interested, you can come on a Friday or something. Um, there is a question, are we allowed to, oh yeah, so the, going back to the project uh, rules, so you have at least four different algorithms that we cover in class, and no more than one of these submissions, one of these six, should involve uh, a, a machine learning library, like uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow or, uh, um, or scikit-learn or something. Related to that, there's a question, if we are allowed to use PyTorch or TensorFlow for one of the submissions, does the CAD machine constraint still apply? Uh, not necessarily because, uh, so this is someone who clearly has used these libraries. Some of these libraries are not going to work well on the CAD, library, CAD machines, simply because they require more resources than uh, computational resources than are available. If you want to do that, um, you are allowed to use, you're welcome to use some other uh, 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 machine that you have. I, I would recommend using something like uh, Google Colab, uh, if you're familiar with that. If, you, if you're not, just search for Colab, C-O-L-A-B. Um, there's another one, another question. Do we ever submit the code for the project in the same way that we submit a homework code? Yes, at the end of the semester, there'll be a final submission for the project, at which point you'll submit a report, a final report, and your code, just like you do for your homework. Um, Another question is, are ID3 and margin ID3, I think you mean perceptron and margin perceptron, different learning algorithms. I would count them as the same because they belong to the same uh, um, base thing. So all the perceptron variants are basically the same algorithm. So in the, if you're you know, using a perceptron, I would suggest um, use average perceptron and then you have, uh, you, you chances are your performance will be better. Other questions? Uh, yes. Yes, you're allowed to do anything you want. Um, and I'm not going to limit you to any reprocessing uh, simply because unlike the homeworks for the project, I want you to explore uh, uh, these ideas in particular, pre-processing, the choice of algorithms, the um, you know feature transformations. Pre-processing is, feature transformation is a pre-processing. Um, feature selection, if you are interested in going that way. Uh, and I want you to make those decisions and justify them in your report. No, uh, so good question. 
So the question, just to in case you, uh, uh, you didn't hear, uh, are we required to meet a certain accuracy? The answer is not really. What I do expect is you to have what I think of as reasonable accuracy for that class of algorithms. So for instance, um, let's say you implement an average perceptron um, on uh, the TF-IDF features. And let's say you get 90% accuracy on the uh, on the public benchmark. And then I, when I run my implementation of average perceptron, let's say I get, I, I'm just making these numbers up, let's say I get 65. It suggests that something is off. Let's say then I compare to the average perceptron implementations of everyone in the class uh, or some sub, uh, a reasonable subsample. And I find that everyone in the, the subsample of the class gets mean of 68 and one standard deviation of say four. You're clearly more than one standard deviation away. So then I'll be like that. Um, so the, in some sense, I want you to get the numbers that are expected for that approach. Um, so, you know, there are some approaches that maybe only you will try at which point we have to kind of figure out how to think about that. And I have a sense of how much performance you get on this data. Uh, because I've been playing with this for a while. So I, I, I know what to expect. Sure. Um, so the question is about uh, descriptive statistics. Uh, uh, second. The descriptive statistics of the data, um, before we do anything, is this visible? Okay, so um, what I mean, that's what you're asking, right? So uh, uh, so anytime you're given a data set in, you know, in, for any new task, you don't just immediately apply the, all the algorithms you can think of. You first need to understand the data. What, what does that mean? Um, what does it mean to understand a CSV file? So one thing that you can think about is how many examples are there? What's the ratio of this to that? If the features are meaningful, uh, like for instance, in your uh, project data, the, one of the feature sets has it, it, it actually is a meaningful, uh, is not just numbers, right? Uh, this is the metadata about the person, about the case. Then it would be good to know what are the proportions of the different labels that uh, of the different values those features take. Uh, or if they are real valued features, what's the mean and standard deviation of each call? Uh, the, what this allows you to do is, honestly, you may not learn anything from these features themselves, but from this analysis by itself, but it gives you um, uh, certain tools, one or certain insights. For example, you might know that you might notice that there is one feature. Let's say you have hundred features, all of them are real value. Let's say feature number one to feature number ninety nine are all in the range of minus one to one, and feature number hundred is in the range of 1000 to 1010 you might think about normalizing that column so it might it might give you insights about whether certain columns might be normalized for a descriptive feature let's say that there is a certain value of a certain feature let's say there's feature number 1 takes three values um, a b c and let's say a happens 50% um, of the time b happens 49% of the time and c happens only 1% of the time this might give you a hint that maybe feature C is rare in the data. So it will it might give you some ideas about further analysis that you might want to do. Do you want to maybe measure the error only on that examples where that uh, uh, the feature is C? So more than anything else, this opens up the door for further analysis or further pre-processing. So anything of that type. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. If we do that kind of analysis for every single column, especially for something like bad reports, is that even possible for a human being to read all that? No, absolutely not. So then you have to do some sort of uh, filtering uh, programmatically and only present the interesting cases. That's a good uh, question. If you have like 100,000 features, what does it mean to, it, it makes no sense to report 100,000 means and 100,000 standard deviations because you know you can't really say, nobody's gonna read it. Then you start looking for outliers in those things. Outliers tend to be interesting. 
it out that one of the six uh, uh, submissions could be implemented using torch or TensorFlow. Yes. Um, if they, and that the submission name, the code that we submit or the CSV file that we submit to CAD? Both. The code? Yes. Both of them. I mean, uh, of all the submissions I make in Kaggle, the, the CSV upload, uh, in those submissions, only I could only upload one that is. That's right. So, so let, let, let me make it clear. You can upload any number of submissions to Kaggle, um, of which six of them will be, you have to mark them off as official submissions. I would recommend, strongly recommend, um, Kaggle has an, uh, you can, it allows you to add a comment uh, on every submission. I would strongly recommend you add a comment saying, this was this algorithm with this second, for example. And you, let's say you have 50 submissions. You need to pick six of them as your official submission. Among those six, no more than one can be can use an external library. You don't have to. All six of them can be code that you implement. Right? This is uh, at most one. Other questions? Yes. On this data, I don't remember. Um, I, 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 I honestly don't remember. Uh, it's somewhere in some file that I have, I have to look it up. Yes? Um, I think for the former, we were always given different forms of the data set. You have to do that yourself here. Well, my question was more so, in the homework, we always use the same forms for any set of hyperplan. I would recommend the same thing here. Okay. Yes. So don't, like, regenerate. don't regenerate them because then that introduces another uh, source of randomness, another source of variability, and rather not have that. We use the same folds throughout the whole project or for each algorithm? I, if, if I had to do it, and this is just me, I would use the same across the entire project. Okay. Yeah. I've seen people do other things also, but if it was me, I would just freeze that so that I don't have to I don't have to think about that again. Um, other questions about projects, uh, homeworks, midterm? Yes. So in every project, uh, project master in future, do we need to submit all the code that we No, so the only time you'll need to submit your code is at the final uh, for the project report at the end. Um, so, uh, so I don't need to submit any sort of code for the project master one? No. You don't, in fact, the following situation might happen. You might submit something for project milestone one. At the end of the semester, you might realize you don't like this submission and it doesn't become one of your official submissions. It has happened. Okay. Uh, there's another question. Should we set the random seeds to reduce randomness and help with debugging? Absolutely, yes. So this is something that uh, is in general good practice across any uh, use of machine learning, not just in the class, but even beyond. Anytime you're running something, anytime you're using a learning algorithm, whether it's something you implement or something that's in a library, set the random seed so that, that uh, if you run the same program two times, you you will encounter the same sequence of steps. This is going to help in two ways. First, it will help with debugging. Um, several of you had trouble debugging your perceptron code because you didn't set the random seed and you ran it twice and the bug shows up once and not the second time. So always, always set the random seed. And the second advantage is it helps someone else reproduce your results. Imagine the following situation happens. Let's say you didn't set the random seed and you just got incredibly lucky. You accidentally ended up with a sequence of random numbers that got you 100% accuracy. And then you get excited and you report it and someone else runs it and it never shows up. How are, are were you lucky or were you unlucky? I would call that unlucky um, because you know the, the reproducible results are important. So the way, one way to ensure reproducible results is to set the random seed. This is true for with your own code. This is true if you use any of the machine learning libraries. And it turns out setting the random seed in Python uh, for machine learning code is complicated. For example, if you're using PyTorch, I think there are four random seeds that need to be set to the point where some libraries have like a function that says set all random seeds. Um, there's the Python one, there is the one from NumPy, there's one from Torch, and then there's one more that I can't remember. Uh, does anyone remember 
what the anyway there are many different random seeds so make sure you set all of them and typically the best way to do that is to make that one of the first statements in your code when it runs that way it's the same random seed that's set every time okay um one more announcement and then we'll actually get to the content of the class and this has got nothing to do with the uh, uh, any anything related to class just wanted to uh, announce this uh, ACM club that's getting kicked off uh, on the 14th. I think that's the day after tomorrow. Uh, you probably can't read anything that's written in the small font, so I'll zoom in. So it's at 5 p.m. on the 14th in the third floor of MEB. Uh, this is the relaunch of uh, the ACM Computing Club. It's mostly for undergrads, but I don't know if, if a grad student shows up, they'll get, I don't think they'll get kicked out. Uh, I'm told there'll be pizza, I'm told there'll be t-shirts, I'm told there's, uh, you can become club officers and just engage in general sort of computing geekery. Um, if you're interested, uh, feel free to attend this thing. Um, if you are, if you want to learn more about the various clubs that, the, that are in the School of Computing, uh, you can either try to remember that URL or do what I actually did, which was just search for CS. Um, ACM club and click around till you get there. Um, if you're interested, make sure you go there. I would normally ask if you have any questions, but uh, I don't have any answers about this. So let's just move on. So we're going to continue our exploration of com computational learning theory. We're going to look at computational learning theory for at least another two lectures including today. Today, we're going to talk about agnostic learning. Just to remind you of uh, where we are and how we got here, computational learning theory is the mathematical theory of generalization. I've seen this being described as what are the laws of nature when it comes to learnability or learning. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most dominant or the one of the most uh, uh, successful um, frameworks for computational learning theory is probably approximately correct learning. And the idea here is uh, very simple. It starts off by with the assumption that um, we can't hope to ever learn the exact function that is hidden from us. In fact, we can't even, uh, so we can only uh, ever hope to get a good approximation of it. And if we are extremely unlucky, we might even not get, a, we might not even get a good approximation. So we, we have to give ourselves the chance that we are just unlucky and we don't get a good approximation. Probably approximately correct learning tries to quantify what's the probability that learning will produce an, a, a classifier that is good enough, meaning has a low error. And uh, we looked at uh, this idea of Occam's razor. We looked at uh, uh, in two settings. In the first setting was in the case where uh, actually we just looked at one setting so far. So the, the Occam tracer that we looked at was in the case where the learner is exploring a finite hypothesis space and is guaranteed to find a function that's consistent with a data set. And the question that we are asking is if that happens, how many examples does it need to be consistent with to give this fact guarantee? And that gives, following that line of uh, uh, argument gives us this Occam's razor theorem that essentially says the complexity parameter of importance is the size of the hypothesis space that the learner explores. If the number of uh, functions that the learner explores is large, then uh, you need to see a lot more examples to have the same guarantee. And the, the, this theorem gave us a tool to analyze certain classes of functions. We could look at a set of functions, for example, all conjunctions, and say that the log of the size of the hypothesis space is linear in the dimensionality, so it's fact learning. So we get, it's, it's basically, uh, think of this as a, a little tag that you can attach to that set of functions or a gold star here. It's fact learnable because the log, the log of the size of the hypothesis space is not exponential, whereas the set of all Boolean functions is not fact learnable. So we saw some positive and negative uh, learnability results. Today, we're going to look at uh, this idea called agnostic learning. So we've already seen Occam's razor for the consistent classifier setting. 
And let's just enumerate all the assumptions that we needed to make in order to get to that Occam's razor theorem. The first assumption that uh, we started off with is that there is some possibly unknown distribution, a reservoir of examples uh, from which the training set is sampled and from which the future examples will also be sampled. This distribution is, we assume, fixed. We don't care what it is, but we only care that it doesn't change. The second assumption that we had was that the hypothesis space is finite because we wanted to, we, we, the size of the hypothesis space does not make sense as a complexity parameter if it's infinite. And then the third uh, assumption that we had was consistency. Now, uh, simply put, this assumption said, no matter what the true function is, my learning algorithm will find a classifier in my hypothesis space that perfectly agrees with the training data. If it does, then we have the Occam's razor uh, guarantee. So for that, uh, for today and uh, the next lecture, we're going to ignore, we're going to start removing these assumptions one at a time. Today we'll remove the second assumption that, sorry, the third assumption that says that uh, we have consistency. And then uh, for the next lecture, we'll remove the assumption that the hypothesis space is fine. So let's uh, think about this last assumption. Is it a reasonable one? What do people think? For any classifier, no matter what the ground truth is, there will be one function in my set that perfectly agrees with that function, with the ground true function. Yes. Um, I think that it's not reasonable because there is probably some noise and some uncertainties in our test set and the training set. We only care about our training set. We want our class, so importantly, consistent only with the training set. There is going to be, uh, I, I like how you said this, but there could be noise and uncertainty and you disentangle them and they are two different things. Because you can think of noise as a function. I'm just going to fit the training set and I'm going to fit the noise as well. Uncertainty, you can't fit it because it's actually a coin toss. So you can always fit the noise, but you might not end up uh, having, you might end up having to have a very large set of functions to be able to find something that's consistent with noise. Uh, to put it, in a, to give you an example, to make it a concrete example, imagine that your true concept is, um, is the stock price of uh, uh, Apple going to go up or not? It's a binary classification problem. Um, I mean, given everything that we know, the input is everything that we know about the company and the world today, and the label is a prediction about the stock price tomorrow. Now, if we are going to assume that the true concept lies in a finite set of functions, what might that set look like? How could we possibly come up with a set of uh, functions that contains the true concept when we have no idea what it might even be? So this is a bit of a uh, unreasonable requirement. So, we assume that the learning algorithm can always find the true concept in the hypothesis space. The agnostic learning setting says, let's get rid of the assumption. The learning algorithm is agnostic to the choice of the uh, hypothesis. So if you want to think of this as pictures, the red dot here represents the true concept. The red circle represents the set of functions that nature uses to pick its function. Uh, pick the true concept, so the red dot always lies inside the red circle, and the learning algorithm explores something that contains all of the red circle. So it always, no matter which function is inside this, it's inside the hypothesis space, so the learning algorithm can find it. In agnostic learning, we drop that assumption. What if we are trying to learn a concept uh, C using a hypothesis space H, but we have no reason to believe or disbelieve that uh, F is contained inside the hypothesis space. So F is this uh, function here. This setting is called agnostic learning. Thus, we drop the assumption that the set of functions nature uses is contained in the set of functions that the learner searches. 
And to me, this is a more re reasonable assumption because we have no idea what set of functions nature uses. So the question is, given that we are dropping this assumption, what can we say about sample complexity? Sample complexity, just to remind you, is how many examples do we need to have this epsilon delta guarantee, to have the fact guarantee? Is the setting, uh, does the setting make sense? And any questions about that? Yes. Uh, we might be more samples because if we're trying to find a function that's not in each, uh, we first have to kind of show that there is no function that is consistent with the data inside of each. We likely need more examples, that's right. In fact, the situation is far worse than that. We may not, we may find a function. Actually, I'll come back to my. Uh, story of doom and gloom in a bit. There's another comment. So we might be better examples to examples that are inside all the Oh, that's a good one. The, the, the suggestion is we might need better examples, well-crafted examples. Unfortunately, we don't get to control the examples because in the pack setting, the examples are drawn randomly from this unknown distribution. So we can't control that. The choice of examples, once you start thinking of the choice of examples, we are moving away from this IID setting to something that looks like teaching, where there are well-chosen examples so that the learner can discover the concept easily. And teaching becomes non-trivial to uh, analyze. Or that's what uh, us teachers like to think about. Yes. Uh, just a question. So what's the guarantee that the hypothesis that we just actually learn anything. Right? Let's say these are the different sets. Mm -hmm. So let's say that we have, so, so let's say this is H and this is C, and this is F here. That's a very good comment. The, que the, the comment is, or the question was, what's the guarantee that uh, we might, we, we learn anything because these are completely different sets. Um, so it's possible that the learner is exploring a very, very different region of the space of all functions. So you might never get anything meaningful. The best we can hope for at this point is can we get how close can we get? And closeness in terms of measured in terms of accuracy. Maybe we won't, not maybe, we are, in fact, that's the next point, really. We are not guaranteed to have zero training error. Why? Because the true function does not reside in the search space. There is no, there, there's, going, there's going to be, there may not be any consistent function in our search space with the data. So the best we can hope for is um, if I find a good classifier using my training set, will the performance on future examples be much worse than that? That's pretty much all we can do. Does that make sense? Because we have no other, uh, nothing else to go with. To put this concretely, suppose you can find a classifier that has low training error. Remember, the training error is simply the, consider all the examples where the function f, the true function and the hypothesis disagree. The training error is simply the number of such functions divided by the size of the, Training examples. It's a fraction of training examples where the classifier makes a mistake. One thing you can do is learn a function that has low training error. You can even try to find the function that has the minimum training error. But we don't really care about the training error. We can easily find a classifier that has zero training error. What we really want is a statement that talks about future examples, unseen examples. What we want is the generalization error. We would like the generalization error of a hypothesis to be low. Recall that the generalization error is simply the probability that the true function and the hypothesis disagree with each other 
on examples that are drawn from this distribution on x that's drawn from b. So the game that we are trying to play with agnostic learning is can the empirical error tell us something about the generalization error? If we are able to find a classifier that has low empirical error and maybe some other properties, can we say something about its future performance? Can we bound its future error um, in some way? That's the, that's the goal of uh, the analysis that agnostic learning tries to do. Yes. Oh, I'm saying so uh, the distribution here is unknown. Yes. And uh, we are trying to find the empirical truth. So how are we, go, go on. So how are we supposed to calculate the empirical error when we were forgotten? We know the empirical error. The, the empirical error is the expression on top. It's on the training data. No, but how are you going to measure it? Like, is it... Uh, are, we, are you talking, just to clarify, are you talking about the empir what? empirical error or the generalization error? Generalization, the training data. No, this, this is also the training error. So the top, the expression on top is the training error or the empirical error. The expression at the bottom is the generalization error. Which one are you talking about? Mm -hmm. So the, let's just uh, make go, go over this once again. The expression at the top is something that you can calculate. Because let's say you're, you're currently trying to evaluate a certain hypothesis, a certain function. You enumerate each example in your training set and the training set consists of the true label. F of X is simply the true label. And you apply your classifier H of X and you ask among the training examples, how many examples were incorrectly predicted? And the fraction, that's your training error. So you can calculate it, it's simply a for loop. What you cannot calculate is the generalization error. The generalization error cannot be calculated because we don't know the distribution D. So this is kind of an interesting uh, intellectual question, or if you want, it's an interesting puzzle. There is this distribution D. We don't have access to it. We have access to samples from it. I want to somehow say, make a statement about error sub D of H, but I am not allowed to calculate it. I cannot calculate it because the distribution is not known to me. What I can calculate it is error S. Can I, can I use error S to say something about error D? That's the goal of agnostic learning. Does that, uh, okay. Other questions? If you're like me, when you first see this, this uh, uh, might be like a very annoying puzzle because it's not clear how to solve this. Yes. Can we use by the bound? Or is it going to be like, we have this bound and with this probability, we believe it was correct. I think that's the kind of bond we'll provide. <coughs> so, yes. So you told us that the target function might not lie in the uh, effective space. That's right. And you also told us that uh, we want to get the generation error uh, using the empirical error. So which one is it? Which one is the main point of having? The goal of agnostic learning, let's just make, uh, let me enumerate all the things that are relevant here. The first point, the definition of agnostic learning is when the when we have when we drop the assumption that the target function lies in the search space of the hypo, uh, of the classifier, because the target function is not may not be available to the the learner, the training error may not be zero will need not be zero. Okay, what we really care about is the generalization error. The only thing we can actually measure is the training error. So the theory of agnostic learning tries to say, if I pick a classifier that has low training error, would that mean that the generalization error will also be low? How low, how bad will the generalization error be if I pick a classifier that has a low training error? That's the game that we're going to play. And to make that guarantee, to, if I demand that my generalization error should be low, how many examples do I need? The same thing that we tried before. Okay, so this is a good segue to something completely different. The way we are going to address this puzzle is we're going to use tail bounds. How many people have seen tail bounds before? 
you've seen it. I mean, even if you're not raising your hand, you've probably seen it in some probability and statistics class. It may come at the end of the semester when you know the semester is kind of fading out and you're like, I don't care. Uh, the idea is, imagine that you have a random variable. The question we are trying to ask with tail bounds is, how far can this random variable get from its mean? What's the probability that a sample will lie in the tail of this distribution? You've, you may have seen certain named inequalities before. Um, the law of large numbers is something that hopefully you, you're familiar with. The law of large numbers simply says, as you conduct a trial more and more often, as you, uh, as you collect more and more samples, the empirical mean converges to the true expectation. Um, a simple experiment for that is, imagine that you have a coin with an unknown bias. The probability of heads, maybe it's not 50%, maybe it's, you don't know what it is. And you want to estimate uh, what the probability of heads would be. You toss the coin um, m times, and you calculate how many, what fraction of the tosses were heads. And you say that that, that is like the probability of uh, uh, the, the coin producing heads in a random toss. But as the number of trials that you conduct increases, as m increases, you get a better estimate of the number of, uh, uh, of the true probability. This is the empirical mean, and this is the true mean. So as m increases, we get a better estimate of the true, uh, uh, true uh, expectation. Does this make, are people, people should be familiar with this, right? At least intuitively. Now, while this is true, this is a statement in the limit. In the limit that m tends to infinity, this fraction here, the number of heads divided by m, will be the probability of heads. Imagine that m is like the size of the training data or the number of experiments you can conduct. You cannot conduct infinite experiments. You cannot access infinite data. So how fast does the left-hand side approach the right-hand side as the number of trials increases? That's the question of interest here. And there are standard inequalities that uh, also exist out there. Um, maybe some of you have seen these inequalities before. The Markov's inequality uh, uh, is a statement about what's the probability that a certain random variable exceeds some value A. Probability that a random variable x is more than a is going to be less than or equal to the expected value of x divided by a. It's a classic uh, statement, uh, which I don't know. Does this show up in prop stats? Silence suggests no. Sorry. It is in the prerequisites class. The, is this in the the uh, foundations of data science? Excellent. So at least half the people in this class have seen Markov's inequality before. If not, you've seen it now. Uh, we won't be using Markov's inequality. I'm just kind of introducing it because uh, just to kind of get you into this uh, mode of thinking about probabilities of, uh, about uh, of random variables taking certain values. Chebyshev's inequality uh, asks, what's the probability that the the distance the difference between the absolute difference between a random variable and its mean is more than k standard deviations away? These are uh, a classic result in probability, and we're not going to use either of these. What we really want is, it turns out, we, we in our in our uh, in what we're trying to do, we want to bound the sum of a collection of random variables because uh, the we'll see why in a bit. And moreover, we also want to uh, talk about how fast this convergence happens as the number of trials increases. So it turns out, and all of this is just a preamble to introduce the next thing. The tool that we need to use is called Hefting's inequality. Hefting's inequality bounds how much the sum of a set of random variables or the av average, if you will, the empirical mean uh, differs from the true mean. So it's uh, I'm not going to read out this expression. Instead, let's uh, kind of uh, tease this apart and come back, put them, put it back together uh, at the end. Suppose you have some uh, uh, an event that can be either true or false, and uh, like a coin toss, heads or tails. 
And let's say there's a certain true mean for the probability of uh, seeing H. Let's call that P. Let's say you conduct a bunch of trials, M experiments. In other words, you just you toss the coin M times. And you can calculate what fraction of those things, of those trials, um, was H. So you can calculate the empirical mean. And that thing is P bar. This inequality in the middle here is asking P, the true mean, is more than the empirical mean plus some epsilon. You're asking what, what is the probability that the true mean will be more than epsilon away from the empirical mean that has been calculated using M trials. You toss the coin M times and Presumably, as the number of tosses increases, you will get a better and better estimate of the true mean. Does that uh, intuitively that should make sense, right? As the number of tosses increases, p bar should be closer and closer to p. The question this is asking is how fast does p bar get close to p? Specifically, it's asking what's the probability that the true mean is more than epsilon away from the empirical mean? And Hefting's inequality, this is one of Hefting's inequalities. Uh, it says that this expression, uh, the empirical mean, will not be too far away. And in fact, as m increases, this probability, the, the probability that the true mean is more than epsilon away from the empirical mean, as m increases, it drops exponentially uh, past to zero. To something, it becomes negligible very quickly because e power minus. 10 is much, much bigger than e power minus 100. With just 100 trials, you get a much, much better estimate uh, of the true probability. So this is the tool that we are going to use. And the cool thing about this tool, about this uh, inequality is, not only does it say, as the number of trials increases, you get faster, you get closer and closer to the true mean. It actually says, how quickly do you get uh, close to the true mean? And the answer is, you get exponentially fast to the true mean. Any questions about this inequality? And I'm just giving this to you as a statement of fact. If you're interested in the proof, I can point you to resources or maybe you can look it up yourself. Think think of this as a given. Yes. So, uh, is the different symmetric related uh, to the like, No, it's not. Actually, that's a good question. So, um, the let me draw this on a number line here. So this is zero and this is one. Let's say p sits here, and let's say p bar sits here. So the question, uh, the this is asking, what is the probability that p is within epsilon on one side of p bar? There is another Hefting's inequality which talks about the other side. There are two Hefting's inequalities. They look very similar. And the answer is basically that in both cases, it drops exponentially fast. So it really tight, gets tightly uh, close to the true mean. So really, the instead of putting, let's say that after M trial, I calculate an empirical mean of P bar. And let's say my threshold for uh, goodness is epsilon, and I say that this quantity here is epsilon. This statement is asking, what is the probability that p bar lies there outside? Sorry, the true mean. So, can you see this color? Okay. What's the probability that the true mean? lies here. And what the statement says is, as the number of trials increases, the probability that the true mean lies more than epsilon away is going to become negligible very quickly. Other questions? Yes. Does epsilon have to be between zero and one? Absolutely. We are talking about probabilities. Okay. And in fact, epsilon is going to be a very small number um, because we're going to ask, we really want P and P bar to be as close as possible to each other. Epsilon 
eventually is like that epsilon in the uh, the other pack, uh, the uh, other Occam's razor. It's basically that. How far is uh, uh, is this thing from uh, the best thing that we know so far? Yes. So I just want to confirm. This is a general mathematical truth yes. for any random variables. Right? Yeah, uh, any. Uh, this is this particular expression is true for Bernoulli trials. Bernoulli trials. Yes. All the random variables must be Bernoulli. Trials. In this case. Okay. Yeah. What's M? M is the number of trials, M independent trials here. So how many times did you toss the coin? How many independent trials did you conduct to estimate the P bar? Other questions? Yes. Can you summarize that as binary? Oh, think of it as a coin toss. Okay, so this is the tool that we'll use, and I'm not going to talk about why this is true. I'm just kind of I hopefully conveyed the intuition that this is correct. As the number of trials increases, you're going to get close to the true mean. Let's go back to agnostic learning. The trick that we are going to do use is to consider the, the generalization error or the true error as a random variable. Error D is a random variable. We don't know what it is. So let's make it a random variable. So now the statement that we are going to ask um, is how well can we estimate that random variable using the trials that we have? What are the trials? The training error over M examples is an empirical estimate of the true error. Each, so for each example in the training set, imagine that you're tossing a coin. Either that example was correct or it was not. You aggregate how many times it, it was incorrect, you count how many times it was incorrect, divide by the number of examples that you have, and that gives you the training error. It behaves exactly like the empirical estimate of the probability of the coin giving H. It's basically identical. It, 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 is the same sort of a mathematical object. The true probability of the coin giving heads is analogous to the true error here. We don't have access to that thing. And our goal is to estimate that quantum. So the question that we want to ask is, what's the probability that the true error, error sub D, is more than epsilon away from the error that we have computed? Why is this interesting? We can compute the empirical error on a training set. We can do that because we have a classifier. We can just enumerate over each, over each example. In fact, we can even set up a learning algorithm that says enumerate every possible classifier that exists and find the one that has the lowest training error. Let's say the one that has the lowest training error has uh, an error of 0 0.01. And let's say your learning algorithm decides to pick that. The question that the, this question says, what's the probability that the true error is more than some epsilon away from 0 0.01? If the true error is 0 0.01 plus epsilon. If that happens, that's a bad situation. And we would like to make that, we would like to control that. We'd like to ask how many examples does it take to make sure that doesn't happen. So that's why we that's where we're going with this. So our goal is to bound the true error uh, uh, being, uh, uh, sorry, our goal is to find a probability of the true error of the event that the true error is more than epsilon away from the generalization error. And this perfectly fits the Hefting's inequality template that we saw. We're going to, before I move on, does, are there any questions about this? The sort of one technical trick, not trick, the technical sort of a, uh, or rather a clever bit here is to treat the generalization error as a random variable and to treat the uh, training error as an empirical estimate of that random variable. Once you open that door, suddenly the whole set of uh, all these tools like Huffington's inequality and all those things show up. And from now on, it's just actually, it turns out it's routine algebra. But 
the idea that we're going to consider the true error as a random variable is the clever bit that uh, that may, that drives this proof. Yes. It could be, but quite likely it's not going to be. Or uh, there's actually, a, it, it, there is, it turns out, an analogous guarantee that might actually be in your homework even. Um, but uh, for at least for the lecture, we're not going to go. The, the specifically, what we want to know is what's the probability that, or rather, the error D of H, it's a random variable, is greater than error S of H plus epsilon. If this happens, then the hypothesis H has fooled the training data, has fooled the learner into thinking it's a good hypothesis by having a low error, when in fact it's bad. It's more than epsilon away from the low training error. And we are going to ask, what's the probability that this bad situation happens? <clears throat> At this point, I feel like I've written what should be in the next slide, so might as well bring it up. So we want to know what's the probability that the true error is more than epsilon away from the generalization error. And at this point, we have we can directly apply Hefting's inequality. Hefting's inequality, Hefting's inequality tells us that uh, this probability is going to be less than e power minus 2 m epsilon squared. Let's make sure that we are all on the same page. Error D of the hypothesis is simply the probability that the uh, f of x and h of x are not the same. Error s of, the hypo of a hypothesis is the fraction of times that happens. So in fact, the specific random variable is the generalization the, the, or the, the event here of interest is on a random example, what's the probability that these two things disagree? And M here is simply the number of times we have uh, tested the hypothesis H. How many times do we test the hypothesis? As many times as we have training examples. So it's simply the size of the training data. Epsilon is uh, one of, it's a parameter to this thing, so we don't calculate it. We're going to eventually derive an expression that connects M, that connects Epsilon. We'll bring in a delta, we'll bring in a size of the hypothesis space, and we'll get an inequality that says, if you have these many examples, then we get a guarantee that looks like the pack guarantee, like the Occam's razor. So let's now work this through because after this, it's mostly just algebra. So the probability that a single hypothesis H, we're still talking about one function H, right? The probability that a single hypothesis has a training error that is bad. In other words, that is more than epsilon away from the, uh, uh, the true error is bounded by this expression here, e power minus 2m epsilon squared. But that just, that's just one hypothesis. The learning algorithm, what it does is it may not pick this hypothesis. It may pick some other hypothesis in its uh, search space. So in fact, the learning algorithm is going to try to find some function inside uh, a hypothesis space, capital H. We don't know which one it will pick. So let's assume the worst case scenario. Let's ask, maybe there's some function inside this hypothesis space that is bad. So we can ask, what's the probability that at least one element of capital H has this property? The probability that there exists a hypothesis whose training error is, uh, whose true error is more than epsilon away from the training error is bounded on top by the size of H times e power minus 2m epsilon squared. This is exactly the same argument that we used for the previous Occam's razor bound. It's a union bound. I'm not going to go over that again, um, but it's simply asking if if a, if a set, a single element of a set for a random 
element of for an unknown element of the set, the probability is bounded on top by this thing. Probability that there exists some element in that set simply bounded by the size of the set times uh, e power minus 2 epsilon square. Let's try to uh, think about this a little bit more. So the probability that for some hypothesis H, it's true error is more than epsilon away from the training error is bounded by size of H times e power minus 2m epsilon square. In, this is uh, written a little bit formally. So let's make this a little bit worse, a little bit uh, informal. What it's saying is the problem, what, what it's asking is what's the probability that some hypothesis that we are entertaining, we don't know which one the learner will pick. So some hypothesis that the learner is entertaining has a generalization error that is bad. By bad, I mean it is more than epsilon away from the uh, training error. Probability that some hypothesis is uh, bad um, is, is bounded by size of h times e power minus 2m epsilon square. And this situation is not a desirable one. Why? Because we don't know which hypothesis our learner is going to pick. Maybe it's going to pick up that hypothesis. Maybe it's just going to pick that one bad hypothesis because, you know, maybe it's a lousy learner. So we want to try to make sure that that situation is improbable. How do we make sure that that situation is improbable? Any ideas? In fact, I want to make sure that this situation here, oh, this situation here has a probability less than delta. What can I do to guarantee that? I, I could, but I want to guarantee that I, I, I want to get rid of that this this expression eventually. Right, this is one minus delta. What is one minus delta? Yeah, let me uh let me draw uh, uh something that might help. So this again, this is zero to one. This is a probability. This quantity here is this whole probability. The inequality says the left hand side is less than some right hand side here. I want the left hand side to be less than delta. The right hand side less than delta? If you make the right hand side less than delta, the left hand side automatically becomes less than delta because we know that this is true. So let's put delta here. Okay. It's not, this is a one-sided condition. It's not necessarily the case that, well, I, I don't want to go into that. That's a bit of a detail that is guaranteed to confuse. If you, if delta were more than this expression, then delta would definitely be more than this thing here. There's a suggestion that says get a lot of examples and eventually that's what we're going to get. This is the same game as before. We want this, this probability to be smaller than delta. And one way of guaranteeing that is to make this thing smaller than delta. So size of h times e power minus 2m epsilon square is less than delta. If this is true, let's uh, go through this. If this is true, then this quantity is going to be less than delta. If that quantity is less than delta, then it's a rare event that there's a bad classifier. How could it possibly be the case that uh, your learning algorithm is going to find it? The learning algorithm, does it make sense? Even a lousy learning algorithm is not going to find it if it does not exist. So we want to try to make sure that the bad uh, situation is improbable. So now, finally, we are in a place where we can literally just manipulate symbols. We have size of h times e power minus 2m epsilon square is less than delta. I can take log on both sides. I'm going to do this uh, thing here. So log size of h minus 2m epsilon square is less than or equal to log delta. Let me remove. And anytime I say log, I mean natural log. Uh, let me rearrange this. So log size of h plus 
माइनस लॉग डेल्टा Now this thing here, just I'm going to rearrange things again. M greater than one over two epsilon square log size of h minus log delta, but minus log delta is just the same as log one over delta, right? Mm -hmm. I see one person nodding. That's uh, maybe a sign that everyone agrees, or you can ask me a question. Yes. No, it's uh, this inequality is going to behave the same way as the other inequality that we see. It it allows us to ask questions about hypothesis spaces. And actually, the more interesting thing that comes out of this, and actually not this one, but the next thing that we'll see in the BC dimensions, is it sets up natural things to optimize to be a good learning algorithm. We'll see that at the end of the next lecture. But how are we on time? We have enough time to wrap this up. So I just rearrange the whole thing. I get m greater than 1 over 2 epsilon square log size of h plus log 1 over delta. And let me just reiterate the whole process here. If m is greater than this thing, in other words, if the number of examples we have is more than the right-hand side, then the probability of a bad situation happening is going to be less than delta. In other words, the probability of a good situation happening is going to be more than one minus delta. What is a good situation? A good situation is your the, the classifier that your learner produces has an error that is not too far away from the training error, which is pretty much the best we can hope for because we can't hope for low training error absolutely uh, because we are an agnostic setting. If the number of examples is more than this quantity, then bad things are unlikely to happen. The learner is unlikely to produce a bad classifier. Let's interpret this. Uh, sorry, did you have a question? Okay. Um, the, the, the agnostic learner, it does not really care about whether the true function is in the hypothesis class or not. All it does is picks the algorithm, picks the classifier with the lowest training error. And this expression here says, if the number of examples is more than that quantity there, then the classifier that has the lowest training error will have a generalization error also that's not too high. It's going to be within epsilon of the low training error, so things are good. And the amazing thing is we were able to do this without any assumptions about whether the true function lies in the uh, hypothesis space or not. This expression can be rearranged and uh, with a little bit of uh, uh, subtle argumentation, turns out uh, we can do, we can have other interpretations, but let's come, uh, let's uh, uh, stare at this a little bit. Epsilon here, unlike the previous case, is not the error of the classifier, but it is the additional error of the true of the classifier over the training error. It's the gap between the training error and the generalization error. The size of the hypothesis class shows up prominently here. The log of the size of the hypothesis class is once again the complexity parameter. This is an Occam's razor once again. Basically, it says if your hypothesis space that your learner explores is small, then you need to find the, the sample complexity is going to be lower. And uh, the delta shows up uh, just exactly the same expression shows up as before. It's basically saying that if you want a high guarantee that uh, your learner is going to behave well, um, then you might need more examples. I can rearrange this thing uh, to get something called the generalization bound. Um, it says the generalization error, error D, is the, the, the difference between the error D and the error S if you have M training examples, is going to be less than this ugly expression here. It's just rearranging and one subtle argument that I'm going to pretend that uh, does not exist right now. So it's, this is a, a, a way to note that 
if you explore this class of functions, the hypothesis space, then your the gap between your true error and the generalization error is going to be less than this quantity. And it turns out it's a it's a, it's a uh, expression that contains delta. So you can't actually calculate it, but you can say that uh, with probability delta, it's going to be less than this. So what do we have here? And in the four minutes that are left, I want to just, uh, before we go into that, are there any questions? Yes. At least to me, from a proof perspective, this seems no different than the prior option choice here. So it's, if we're just looking at polynomials, which we haven't talked about yet, but I assume that's what we're doing. Either way, we're just doing an L and H, so it seems like the third condition just doesn't matter. Either. What is the third condition? Uh, the third condition. Oh, the size of the the the, the actual hypothesis space. Yeah, you're right. That's that's right. So from the proof perspective, everything that we proved for everything that was learnable in the consistent case is going to be learnable here because log of the size of the hypothesis space shows up. Things that are not learnable there are not going to be learnable here either. In fact, this is a harder setting because we are actually weakening the learner. And of course, things that were learnable, not learnable there are not going to be learnable here. Let's kind of uh, step back a bit. Um, we, we've seen two types of Occam's razors. One of them is when the true hypothesis space contains the true concept, we had this result that says if m greater than um, 1 over epsilon times log size of x plus log 1 over delta, then we have this fact guarantee, provided the log size of x is polynomial. The thing that we just saw, uh, Occam's razor in the agnostic setting, was when the hypothesis space may not contain the true concept. Notice that these two expressions are very similar to each other. The only thing that really changes is you have um, the epsilon square in the denominator, which makes sense. In the agnostic setting, you are assuming less. Because you're assuming less, you have to pay more in terms of the number of examples. Epsilon is a number between 0 and 1. So as epsilon, um, so 1 over epsilon square is going to be bigger than 1 over epsilon. So in the agnostic setting, it says, if you do not care to assume that your true function lies in this search space, then if you want a pack type guarantee, you need to pay by providing more training examples. But the more interesting thing here is it almost seems like learnability depends on nothing but the log of the size of the hypothesis space. Have we solved everything? In particular, does this apply to linear classifiers? And if not, why not? That's right. Linear classifiers are an infinite set. The size of H is infinity. Log of size of H is also infinity. So basically this statement says, if you provide an infinite number of examples, then all things will be good. Now, that's a useless statement. So clearly there's nothing, there's something missing in the theory. And this is, the, this is going to be the content of uh, the next lecture. When we talk about uh, extending this theory to the case where we have infinite hypothesis spaces. And that's going to be a slightly more general version of this. All of this was, the assumption was that the size of hypothesis space is finite. And then in the next lecture, we'll encounter a new way to count the size of certain sets uh, called VC dimension.